Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Lisa Steele, and I'm the Artistic Director at Vitae, where we acknowledge that we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit River, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory, which is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous peoples, Métis and Inuit peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect, and we thank them for it. Tonight, we're pleased to present the second program of media artworks that is part of the inaugural partnership project between VTAPE and Dr. Andrea Fatona's Center for the Study of Black Canadian Diaspora. The program that begins this evening is curated by Fabina Germain Bajala and features six titles in total. Over the next week, one title is presented each Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, and we will continue to, and will continue to be available for the following week until the next title rolls out. Tonight, we begin with a live online dis, uh, introduction by Dr. Fatona, followed by a conversation between her and Fabina Germain Bajala, followed by the first title in her program, Almost Forgot My Bones by Katrin Bowen and Tanya Evanson. And on March 23rd, 2002 at 7 p.m. Eastern time, there will, which, there will be a live online conversation between the curator and the artists featured in her program, moderated by Andrea Fatona. I warmly welcome Dr. Andrea Fatona to introduce the center and Fabina. Andrea. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for the warm welcome and thanks for our ongoing collaboration. I'd like to say this marks um, a really important direction in the collaboration, this ongoing collaboration with VTAPE that started in 2017. Uh, the project, well, the center, the overall goal of the center is to make visible the works of Black Canadian art, contemporary artists, curators, critics, and craftspeople who've been historically erased from uh, the archives of contemporary Canadian art. And so through the development of a dynamic online database, we will host and house the works of, of Black Canadian artists starting in 1987 to the present. Um, this program and the pro previous program really serves to animate the types of works that have been produced by Black Canadian media artists. And um, these programs hopefully will give you a taste of the range and breadth of works produced by Black Canadian media artists. I'd like to introduce Fabina, who is a fourth year undergraduate thesis student in the Criticism and Curatorial Program at OCAD University. Fabina's research focuses on the primacy of the senses in, as modes of uh, knowledge production, as well as access paths to histories that have been made invisible. And um, she uses social practice as a means to um, make these um, histories visible. Fabina employs social practice as well and uses food as a vehicle to get to these memories that have been um, not lost, but actually submerged. So Fabina, over to you to tell us a little bit about your program. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so like you said, my practice looks to acts of care as a way to access and contribute to um, archives of ancestral knowledge. And so within my own research, I'm really interested in the ways that immaterial archives can be tapped into through sensorial acts um, using things like food and language. And so that's really what I based my program in as well and attempted to respond to with the films that I chose. Um, as I was looking through the CFMDC and VTAPE archives, I was thinking about the ways that um, archives of immaterial knowledge can be understood um, can they be accessed and shared through embodied experiences? And what might those experiences look like within Black artistic production? Um, so with that in mind, Tell the Body is a program that explores different diasporic artists and filmmakers' relationships to the immaterial archive. Um, 
And many of the titles interrogate the purpose of language in the formation of self and how it can open doors to histories, like in Donna James's Make a Dog, um, but also how it can create barriers to belongings, such as um, in Karen Miranda Augustine's I Call Myself and Don Wilkinson's Dandelions. Um, some of the other works in the program also celebrate the spaces in the archive within which there are gaps, um, spaces of loss and erasure, not by filling them, but by embodying them. So in particular, Nadine Vassin's Emergence and Louise Lillefeld's Hamartia um, both employ silence as a tool to acknowledge the immaterial space, which make up the location um, that Black diasporic peoples have and continue to construct knowledge from. Um, and I think all the films in the program also really beautifully illustrate the, um, the heterogeneity of that location and its physical manifestations um, within the Black community. Um, and lastly, all of the films do a really incredible job um, embodying the archive in a way that both provides access to the archive um, by illustrating one, one person's moment of accession, but also they emphasize the immateriality of the archive um, just by virtue of their form. Obviously, um, because they are films, they only last a moment and we um, can't understand or really know what the artists um, truly are feeling in the entirety of the film. Um, so I think they do a really good job balancing both of those aspects. Thank you. So, you know, as with Temple's program, you folks are taking up this notion, I'm going to bring it up again, as the immaterial archive. And I just wanted wonder if you could unpack that a little bit more, as well as the importance, what you see as the importance of this, uh, pro, this program in relation to this notion that you really uh, at the core of, of what you're working with is about a relationship to the ancestors or generations before us in terms of mm -hmm. tapping into that knowledge. Can you unpack some of that a little bit more in terms of the focus of the world, your yeah. work? Yeah, so um, that this idea of an immaterial archive comes from um, a book that you recommended to myself in Temple by Jenny Sharp. Um, and it really, an, an immaterial archive is really like the scarcity of, of documentary evidence um, of the lives of people who were immaterial to the archiving process. So um, like black and racialized peoples, often slaves as well. Um, and for me, I think my focus um, on this topic really um, stems from my personal experiences growing up in predominantly white spaces. And um, I have very vivid memories from my childhood, um, from you know when my dad spoke Yoruba to me or when we ate okra soup and gari. And those moments really stand out, I think, um, in my mind where I felt physically um, very present. And I think those moments were times when I embodied really the silences and the erasures of myself and other black people around me. Um, and so that was where I really um, came to this programming from. Um, I wanted to understand how other artists were also dealing with those, those very physical and present moments in their own lives and in their own ways. Thank you. I totally um, relate to this notion of the embodied and sensory um, uh, communication of knowledge. And passing on of knowledge. I put on a gala for the first time in my life uh, about in October and this notion of the object and what the object can actually, the, the information about our histories that the object actually communicates to us was very present to me in that act of putting that headgear on. But I wanted to also ask you about language. Um, you know, I've, I've watched Margaret Dog several times and the, the work is in both Jamaica and Patois and subtitled in English. And I wanted, wondered if you could talk a little bit about the challenges of language and translation in the context of the program, but in terms of what you're thinking through in terms of accessing the archive, particularly through language. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think, it's very interesting um, to try and communicate 
um, this like immateriality of an archive, obviously um, trying to speak it into existence is a very um, physical and sensorial moment where it becomes, um, becomes like a moment where you're, you are experiencing this information. And then at the same time, it is becoming immaterial because that sentence is gone the second it's been spoken. Um, so I think when it comes to language, I've really been, I've been considering it as a tool um, to access these banks of knowledge, but also as one of the ways that those banks, these like knowledge banks are made um, immaterial. So it's a very interesting balance between the two um, that I think the program is trying to tease out a little bit um, in a couple of the different films. Thank you. So my last question is, what do you, what do you hope our um, viewers and folks who are consuming this work, watching this work, thinking with this work will gain from the program itself mm -hmm. as it unfolds? Um, so I think for myself, I see um, a thread sort of weaving through the films um, of futurity through remembrance. And I had this idea in my head um, based off of a reading that you actually recommended called Remember the Future by Carlos Fuentes, as well as um, a Candace Hopkins article called We Are Always Turning Around on Purpose. And so this idea of um, survivance through generational knowledge of looking to our past in our quest to imagine our future um, has really been on my mind, especially within the past two years that have been really difficult for a lot of people. Um, and so I hope that um, the audience is able to, to picture themselves within these films and also consider their own past in moving forward within their own future. Thank you so, so much. So we will move on to the actual work. So please scroll down on your screens to the, to the work and click on it and we will be able to watch. Thank you so much everyone for tuning in and for being here.